Ah, one, two, three, four. All right, grappling with the text. First Peter chapter three, verse eight and following. Apparently last week I did not want myself to forget that this is where we start. I had my two sticky notes. Anyway, uh, now where are we in 1 Peter? We're in the table of duties, and here's the whole book. Remember, you can't see it, but this is the structure. And we have, we, we have this table of duties section here, right in the middle of the book. And we talked about all people, government, servants, wives, husbands. And now we start with uh, chapter 3, verse 8, uh, instructions for everyone, remember? Uh, and so it's going to be a kind of a summary. And, in fact, the longest Old Testament quote in the entire book of first Peter right here so finally this is not finally for the book remember we got a lot to go and in fact at verse uh, 13 we're really gonna really gonna pick up on what it means to suffer that long section on, on suffering so this finally is the finally for the table of duties finally all of you and then uh, Peter's gonna give us a list one be like-minded two compassionate three loving as brothers Four, tender-hearted. Five, courteous. A list of five words, almost exclusively uh, used here uh, by Peter. The homophronus, that's like-minded. That just means thinking the same. Uh, here, the second word is uh, sympathis. This means, what's the word we get sympathetic from? So, uh, feeling with one another. This is Philadelphia, uh, brotherly love, loving one another, brotherly, lee, lee, lee. Here, this one is, this is an interesting word. Oisplagidnoi. Oi means good. Like um, you, Caristo means good, thanks. And then the splagidzno um, is uh, this famous word for compassion, the spilling out of the bowels. Uh, so th uh, this means good compassioning. It's an interesting word, only, I think, used here. And then courteous, that probably means humble. So these five things ought to mark the Christian life. A like-mindedness, this is theological. Compassion, that means we are living to serve one another. Love for the brothers, we have uh, love for all people and especially for the people of God. We have a, 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 a good compassioning that, we, that we, are, are, we feel for other people and that we have uh, humility. We're not, we're not seeking after our own uh, stuff but seeking after the stuff that belongs to Jesus. And then, look, not rendering evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead blessing. Now, this is so in key. In fact, Peter's going to emphasize it, knowing that you were called to this, to what? To blessing, that you may inherit a blessing. So we know that we have an inheritance which waits for us in heaven. Inheritance talk is always... Um, talk of the resurrection. Uh, this is our inheritance, the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we have this, uh, we have this coming for us. That we, we are going to live forever in a blessed world. So what do we do? We bless one another. This is the question that Christians ask then. Uh, how can I bless my neighbor? How can I serve my neighbor? How can I love my neighbor? We were called to this, to be a blessing. Now, one of the things um, one of the marks or one of the confusions that we have is this word called. And we, you know, we, we talk about how people have a ministry. And this is probably the wrong way to think. We don't want to think that everybody is called to preach, but every Christian is called to bless. So when we think about, for example, the work of evangelism, that is the church going out beyond the walls, we, we're not thinking of each person, how, well, how do I go out and preach, but rather, how do I go out and bless? And then uh, we're going to have proof of this, and we're going to have this extended quotation from Psalm 34. I wonder if I do it like this. Uh, let's see. Uh, Peter, you want some background info? Okay. Peter has... 12 uh, Old Testament quotes in his book. Most of them are in chapter 2. You can see them listed out here. Chapter 2, he has all this list. And then there's a long spot, I mean, really from here, although it's mentioned here, this long spot where Peter 
doesn't have any Old Testament quotes except for this one right here, Psalm 34. Uh, and it's right in the middle. So that's, you got it? Here's the list. Okay. So he's going to quote this uh, text from Psalm 34. Uh, let's see. It is verses, um, verses 12 through 16, and it takes us all the way through uh, verse 10 to verse 12. And it says this, He who would love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, before we look at what the text is saying, I want to see the beauty in the structure of it, because this is one of the ways that Hebrew poetry presents itself to us as beautiful. So, uh, if you would love life, and look at this, if you would see good days, keep your tongue from evil and speaking deceit, and let him turn away from evil and do good, seeking peace and pursuing it, so that, so that it's kind of a list of your own body parts. You have your own eyes, your own mouth, and your own face. And then it talks about the Lord's eyes, the Lord's ears, and the Lord's face. So the, uh, the eyes of the Lord, that has to do with this here, see? And the tongue and the ears of the Lord. So you're speaking, but the Lord is listening. And the face of the Lord, you're turning away, and so is uh, the Lord, so that you have our eyes, our mouth, and our face, and the Lord's eyes, the Lord's ears, and the Lord's face. See this? Okay. Now, remember, the Lord's ears being open to their prayers was already uh, what we had here, that their prayers may not be hindered, so that we want to know what it takes for the Lord to listen to our prayers. So, the psalmist says, if you would love life instead of hate life, and see good days instead of evil days, here's what you do. You don't speak evil, you don't lie, you turn away evil, and you do good. This is really quite simple. The Christian does good. Do good. I mean, it's, we, I don't think we need to make it more complicated than that. Now, do we always do good? That's, I suppose, where it gets complicated. But the Word of God is not complicated. The Word of the Lord is simple. It says to do good. The problem is our own sin. So let's not make good works a complicated theological thing. I mean, good works are hard enough to accomplish just because of our, of our sin and our flesh and the devil who's always fighting against it. So let's not make the complication in the theology and fighting about the third use of the law and all of this nonsense. The, the theology is pretty simple. The difficulty is in the execution of it. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So to chase after peace, to chase after uh, the, uh, uh, the, like, like Paul says in Romans, uh, insofar as possible with you, be at peace with all men. And then there's a reaction from the Lord. Now, this has to do with the theology. This is not karma, but this has to do with the fact that the law offers blessings. Now, the blessings of the law are different than the blessings of the gospel in their extent and also in their conditions, that the blessings of the law are conditional. The blessings of the gospel are unconditional. They're the blessings of faith, not of obedience. But insofar as we obey the law, uh, we, there are blessings from God. The, the, the thing to remember also, though, is insofar as we obey the law, there are also attacks from the devil. So perhaps they equal out in the end, but this is not our concern. Our, our concern is the blessings that God has. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayer. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, remember one final thing here before we get to the last verse. Whenever the, uh, we see the word righteous, we remember that there's two types of righteousness. There is the act of righteousness that comes from the law, and there is the passive righteousness that comes from the gospel. And which righteousness is it? We want to lean always towards the passive righteousness of the gospel and assume that whenever we see the word righteousness, let's see if that fits first. In this case, it doesn't quite fit because it's talking about doing good, etc. So this is probably uh, the act of righteousness of the law. But we remember that when the Lord calls us righteous, he in fact uh, gives us his spirit so that we begin to do these things, to seek peace and pursue it. We actually do it. Now, who will harm you 
Look at this question that marks the end of the vocation section. Who will harm you if you become imitators of that which is good? This word imitators here is in fact the word zealot. If you become a zealot for what is good. Now, Paul will say the same thing when he talks about obeying the law, because the law, the, the sword, the, the punishment is there to punish those who do evil, not who do good. So who will punish you if you do what's good and not what's evil? Will the state come in and get you? Well, in fact, Peter's going to say, where is it? Peter's going to say next, but. <laughs> so the, the answer is, well, nobody should harm us. Nobody should come and hurt us for keeping the law and doing what is good, but it just turns out that the devil is always attacking our good works. Uh, so it should be that if we do good, we, we are rewarded for it, and if we do evil, we get punished for it. But because the devil hates that which is good, uh, he's always going to attack our good works. And even when we do good, you know what's going to follow? I mean... Look, here's the point. Even though we, it talks about all these blessings for doing good, you know what follows doing good? Suffering. Still we do it, but what follows is suffering. Which is why Peter is going to take up now, through the whole next couple of chapters, a long and extended discussion on suffering, and suffering even for doing good. So there it is, the conclusion to Peter's table of duties. Finally, be like-minded, be sympathetic, be Philadelphians, be good, compassioned, and be humble. Don't render evil for evil, but bless, knowing that the Lord has blessed us. In fact, this blessing recalls to us the ascension of Jesus. Remember how Jesus left? The very last picture that the church has of Jesus is that he's ascending into the clouds, he's disappearing from their sight, and he has his hands raised in blessing. And, and the angel says, uh, why are you staring up to heaven? Jesus will return the same way. He'll return blessing us, giving us his gifts. Beautiful stuff. All right, thanks for uh, watching the whole thing. Look at that, 12 minutes. Uh, thanks for sticking with it. Uh, we'll be back next time uh, to take up the topic of suffering for doing good. Everlasting is solid, Christian, and free because it is viewer supported. Your monthly gift of five, ten, or twenty-five dollars is the reason that we can continue to improve and expand these tools for online Christian outreach and discipleship. To make a one-time donation, sign up for the Lutheran Ninja Clan regular giving, or to find information about how to put Worldview Everlasting in your congregation's budget, click donate now. Right.